What the research says is women like a rhythmic motion, usually circular or back and forth, and not just, you know, like a finger poking, but maybe using multiple fingers, using a hand. But the key is- Let's start with sex. Yeah, what do you want to talk not, about? Well, it's not an area that we go too frequently on the show, yeah. but um, I feel like, why not? I love, I mean, everybody loves sex. Yeah, well, let's hope, right? Yeah. All right, so let's start it like this. Tell me what your sex ed class was like. Like, what do you remember? I remember it being like one day out <laughs> of like, you know, all of my, the entirety of my schooling. It was like an hour of sex ed. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't remember it being particularly cringe, but I just remember it being very uh, brief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How much did you learn about the female body? Not a ton. Mm -hmm. So not how about the ton. clitoris? Did not learn a ton about it <laughs> yeah. from uh, from school. No, I mean, I, I had to learn on the job, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Did you learn anything about the clitoris in school? Uh, I mean, I think I learned that it was like analogous to the to the head of the male, of the penis. Yeah. Um, That's huge. Yeah. Most people don't even know that. But I'm the kind of guy that whenever I came across any kind of like biology textbook or anatomy textbook, the first thing that I would do would be to go to the index and look up vulva mm. and, 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 you know, in hopes of like seeing a picture. But you one. actually know that it's a vulva and not a vagina because most people I interact with are like the v outer vagina. I'm like, what outer vagina? The yeah, opening? Like, what, what are we talking about here? That's not, a, yeah, it's not anatomically correct. People who, who refer to the vagina, the vagina is like the canal. Mm -hmm. How correct. am I doing so far? You are like 10 out of 10, sir. Well, I'm not I'm not yeah. the expert here, so I want to- <laughs> I don't know. Volvo owners everywhere are like, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm a fair, I mean, I would say I'm a fairly well-informed cishet male. Yeah. Isn't that the, the terminology <laughs> That's that, the, what we that, say these that days. the wokesters are using? <laughs> Um, but yeah, so our, so what do we need to know about sex? I mean, you're an expert. You just wrote this wonderful book. People are generally what? Like it's a, it's a big question mark for, for people. You think? Oh, so many. So the book has all these sections called Ask Dr. Brighton, which is born out of my readers, my patients. And then weekly on Instagram, I do an Ask Dr. Brighton session. And when I finally informed people it was anonymous, I thought they knew, but they didn't know all of these sex questions poured in. And that really opened my eyes to like, wow, there's so much. There's there's such these big gaps in our knowledge. And then there's this thing called the orgasm gap as well, which is a big issue in terms of like women getting pleasure and where a lot of these conversations were coming from. So there's a section, there's a whole chapter on libido. I think that is a big misunderstanding in women's medicine where women are like, I have a low libido. What do I need to take? Doctors are like, you just need to take testosterone. And that is... I wish that was the answer. Friends, I wish I could just say, just take testosterone, but that's rarely what's going on. Unless you're on the birth control pill or you're postmenopausal, or you've got like extreme stress, something else going on. It's not usually just a testosterone issue. Do you think, are, are many people today suffering from low libido? I don't think that they're necessarily suffering from low libido as much as there there's other factors going on, but as much as women don't actually just understand like how they operate because so you knew a lot more from sex ed um, than the average person, but most people, it's very male centered and their whole perspective is like compare it to a man. That's even medicine, right? It's mm. like we have the male body and then we have the inferior form that comes with like baby making accessories. And so a lot of the comparison is like, well, my husband or my spouse's libido is like this, and therefore I must have a low libido because I don't want it as much as they do. And when you really get down to it, it's not about that. So women, they want to have sex for different reasons. Now, we all live an orgasm. A hormone doctor loves orgasms, so good for your hormones. But a lot of women will also engage sex because they want to feel close. They want to feel that security of a partnership. They want to have bonding. They want to have intimacy. That's called the, uh, the sexual circular response model, where you really want to enter into sex for other reasons than just having an orgasm than just pleasure. So that's part of it as well. And so it's just really complicated because I think men come in and we're talking about heterosexual relationships. That's where the orgasm gap exists. So that, by the way, is in a heterosexual relationship, men are orgasming 95% orgasming of the time and women are orgasming about 65% of the time. So mm. it's a huge gap. And people often will say, well, that's because it's just impossible to make a woman come. And in reality... If women are doing it on their own, it's like over 90% and they're done in four minutes. Like it is 
It is possible, friends. And we know from the studies on lesbian couples, it's about 86% in those couples are having regular orgasms. Wow, that is a huge gap. Yes. I've heard from some female friends that uh, over-reliance on toys like vibrators mm -hmm. actually um, it can be to the detriment of a woman's ability to orgasm with a real life human. Because mm. like, how, yeah. can a, how can a guy possibly compete with a vibrating piece of machinery? Yeah, well, it's not a competition. That's like your ally, like your Batman, and that's like your utility belt, right? That's how you want to think about toys. And so it's not so much that, oh, because you used a toy, like th that's a myth of like, oh, you used a toy, it ruined your clitoris, like for a man. Like the majority of women are going to orgasm because of clitoral stimulation. And so when you're having what everybody defines as sex, there's a whole chapter on all kinds of sex. Um, but most people think, penis in vagina. That's what sex is. And when you define it that way, that's not how women orgasm. They need clitoral stimulation. There's a very small percentage of women who can orgasm by vaginal penetration alone. However, that's questionable of like, well, it, because of anatomy is or positions, is the clitoris also being stimulated during that? And so it's usually like an issue more with the acts being performed and not so much about the toy. And you can bring toys in. Like there are lots of toys that you can use. I have a whole section on toys wow. <laughs> with a male partner, with any kind of partner. Is the book written, I'm assuming it's written for uh, for a woman, for women? Yeah. It Well, I mean, I really hope men read it. I mean, there's an entire orgasm chapter and one of the top Google things about women's sexual health is how to make a woman come. And I can teach you how to do that in there. Wow. <laughs> and then even better, she could teach you how to do that, but you have to communicate. Well, I want to get there, but what are before we do? Everyone wants to get yeah, there. Yeah, we need to. We need. We need a little bit of foreplay first, I guess. <laughs> what are would you say the biggest um, like knowledge gaps for people? Like, where is where does most of the of the confusion that you see come from? Well, so once upon a time, there was this guy named Freud, and he was literally the worst thing to happen to sexual health for women because he had said the clitoral orgasm that's infantile. You should be wanting to achieve the vaginal orgasm, which is again a very male centered approach, like. Men will have an orgasm if they penetrate a vagina in the majority of instances, but it doesn't go the same way for women. Mm. And so women thinking there's something wrong with them, partners thinking there's something wrong with them, that's definitely a big gap in terms of knowledge. And when you consider that, I mean, we just found out, I don't know if you know this, but every estimate of nerves based that everybody threw around about, oh, the clitoris has this many nerves was based on a cow. It wasn't even based on a f like actual human anatomy and wow. they just discovered that it's about 10,000 nerve endings and it needs to be replicated and we need to see like is you know what's the deviation from that but we didn't even know that and medicine didn't even really acknowledge the clitoris until like the 90s like it was wow. like a really long time so I think um you know I have my clitorate necklace on today if you can, can see it, that what wow. it says clitorate, clitorate. Oh, stay wow. on the mic wow. um yes my husband bought me that for my birthday <laughs> It's a nice gift. <laughs> it is. And I was like, that's so perfect. And he's <laughs> like, you talk about it all the time. If people were just clitor it, they would have a lot more pleasure. There would be a lot more, um, well, a lot less frustration, I think, in the bedroom. And so you actually learned about the clitoris. Like a lot of people I talk to are like, yeah, it's just this like little button, right? I'm like, no. That's like the tip of the iceberg and everybody calls it the tip of the iceberg that talks about it because there's this vast structure of legs like extending out into like, you know, around the vulva um, in, you know, so you can get that penetration and get that stimulation, but it's this huge structure and it was designed just for pleasure. Unlike a penis, which is like, it also has to pass urine and pass ejaculate, like it is only for pleasure. Fascinating. Yeah. It, it is literally, it looks like a wishbone. Yeah. It's right? totally like, yeah, make a wish. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but is it not like there is no uh, anatomy textbooks like haven't fully been updated yet to to like account for the knowledge that we have about the the the, the full anatomy of the clitoris, mm -hmm. right? It's like yeah. even in even in anatomy textbooks, I could be wrong, but I feel like I I read that it's still described as just being this like little nub. Yeah, so that's the scary thing is that we're seeing all this labiaplasty and these uh, you know surgeries that are just basically for appearance. They'll say like, oh, it helps you have better sex, and I'm like, actually, it turns out to do the opposite for a lot of people. Um, and that, again, that's very predatory because rather than teaching about what normal anatomy looks like, it's telling the most popular surgery is called the Barbie. Like, 
Barbie, I mean, we've all taken off Barbie's pants. Does Barbie have any anatomy? No. And that's what women are supposed to aspire to be. <laughs> it's called the Barbie. It's called the Barbie, the procedure. What is it? What? Um, Basically taking the inner labia and cutting it off. So it's all tucked in nice and neat. Except yes. spoiler, if you have a baby, you get older. Like there's a lot of reasons that the inner labia will extend between like beyond the outer. Not even problematic. Hmm. But you're right. So surgeons are operating without having a good understanding of the clitoris and the clitoral anatomy, which is scary. Um, uh, there's been lots of medical experts that are like, that's not far off from female genital mutilation because you're going in and you're cutting things b blindly. And there are women who are telling stories about getting this done at like 18. And now they, they only have pain with sex. They have no pleasure whatsoever. And that's really problematic. I mean, the World Health Organization has even you've said like pleasure is a very important aspect of human health, which I feel like in the United States, we are so many generations off from even accepting. Hmm. Well, the clitoris is, uh, I mean, I would love for you to describe if you can, like how, how to find it mm -hmm. for any, um, you know, men that are listening, but also I heard a wild statistic. I, I, I don't actually remember the statistic, but it was something that was really surprising, like, some some huge proportion of women have never taken like a mirror mm -hmm. to their to their vulvas, yeah. Like to really like you know. So I would surmise that there are prob there's probably a significant proportion of women out there that don't know where their own clitoris is either. You know, I think women. I mean, it's a it's a more feeling kind of sensation, like to find right. the clitoris. But you're absolutely right. Um, in the introduction of the book, I go into you know why do we know so little, and we can blame. We can blame society. We can blame the fact that only 18 school or 18 states in the United States mandate medically accurate sex ed. Like there's a lot of reasons, but really at the core of it is that we're taught like from a very early age that the body is a source of shame. And so we don't want to look down there because it's shameful. Like we, I talk all the time with women who are still like, <laughs> we took the tampon smuggling. Like I don't even want people to know I'm on my period. And yet it's like, but we bleed like that's part of being like a woman. This this happens. And yet we are so ashamed of so many things. So you're absolutely right. Not a lot of people look down there. And then even more so anytime there was actually a TikTok that I did and I had a picture of a ton of vulvas and how many women have commented on that saying like, oh, my God, like I'm this one. I'm that one. Like I didn't know I was normal. But just to demonstrate that like this variation is normal, but as you were saying, even in medical textbooks, if you go back, it's very problematic. It's usually white skin, uniform, all pink color. Um, I've never seen a uniform vulva, like anything. Like it is asymmetrical. There are color variations, but everything looks a certain way. And that's like, that's what people get in their head is the standard. Yeah. There's no such thing as like perfection. No, yeah, no. Yeah. It's a big myth. Every, I mean, there's asymmetry all throughout the body. I know. <laughs> So to expect like, you know, like uh, a singular body part to have like this perfect symmetric, perfectly symmetrical form, mm -hmm. it's, um yeah, it's, it's wishful thinking at best. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting is that porn gets blamed a lot. Like I seen like doctors will be like, oh, it's because of porn. That's why women want to have these procedures. I mean, porn probably is rooted in why women want to shave, but that's also personal preference. But if you, so I got really curious and I have to say in writing this book, nobody better ever check my browser history because <laughs> it is certainly seedy. Um, but I just got curious, like how prevalent is labiaplasty and these procedures and like having like a perfect vulva when in fact you look at porn, you will find that the top rated uh, vulvas, you know, uh, what people are voting, they want to see the most of. They have the Audi is what people will call it when the labia minora extends from the labia majora. So people call this the lips. So the inner lips go beyond the outer lips. That's one of the top voted. Like there was all of this variation. And I'm like, actually, as a doctor, I see here's porn with all this variation and what people are voting for, what they want to see, tons of variation. And then we see medicine and we see medical textbooks, which you've perused. And it is just one type and that's it i heard um netter had uh so netter's anatomy anybody who's nerdy knows netter's anatomy and um i heard that he actually his wife was his model for everything so isn't like is that what her vulva looked like or is that what you wanted her vulva to look like or did you um you know have to modify it like how we change names to protect the witness like you know, did yeah. you modify it so she didn't be like hey what are you doing there <laughs> yeah you never know you know there's this funny i have this this great book uh it's called the sex lives of great artists 
artists. Mm. And apparently Michelangelo was so disgusted by the female form that um, yeah. you know, he was gay. Many of the great artists throughout history were gay. He, um, whenever he would have to sculpt a woman, he would basically, he would, ha he would have a male model, mm -hmm. a male figure model, and just like, you know, shave off the penis <laughs> and put be breasts onto like yeah, what an he otherwise thought breasts male. were like he's like oh this is this is uh, the symmetry there's a whole chapter on breasts they're also not symmetrical as long as we're on that topic <laughs> but yeah so you think about these artists and how they portrayed this is uh, this is rooted in what we think of of like the male body is like oh so pristine and like that's that's what we want to compare to and then the female body is just like wah wah you didn't get a penis and I'm like wah wah you didn't get a clitoris like mm. you don't understand. But this is so interesting. So the most desired, at least as far as porn goes, vulva is the quote unquote Audi. Well, it was variation. So it was the Audis, the innies, the like, and very few had procedures done. Hmm. So begs the question, like, why are we chasing procedures? Like, why is it that we have it in our head? Is it Barbie? Yeah. <laughs> is it Barbie that put that in our heads? Or like, what is it? I mean, there's even procedures like bleaching your butt, bleaching like your, uh, you know, your tissue, your vulva, like having these bleaching procedures because it's like, oh, it's too dark down there. But what people don't understand is the genitals are rich in melanocytes. And so these are the pigment producing cells and they respond to estrogen. And so when you get aroused, they can actually get darker and you can have more blood flow down there. And so things are getting darker, but it's normal to have darker tissue. Like, There's an evolutionary reason for that, right? I mean, like when we were yeah. primates, it was a way to visually signal mm -hmm. back when we were a bit more conspicuous about yeah. our about our our goods, so to speak. Yeah. Um, it was a signal to to the males of the species, right? To, to, to come hither. Yeah. Well, you know what's interesting is that when I got into the breast chapter and talking about like, why do, why do we have breasts? And it just was a thought that never occurred to me. And I go looking and it's what the, you know, the experts beyond me in evolution believe is not. It's when we, we became bipedal that there no longer was this swollen anus to signify that like, hey, we're, you know, in our reproductive years. And so instead we got breasts because we're the only mammals that keep breasts throughout our lifetime. Like mm. other mammals don't do that. So why do we do that? And that's the hypothesis is to signal like, hey, we could potentially be a baby making mate. Wow. Super interesting. We're so, we're so complex. <laughs> yeah. But it's, uh. Wow. I know a girl who, um, she was actually very public about this and she was, she's been on the podcast in the past, uh, Vanessa Fitzgerald. She, mm -hmm. um, publicly shared her that she had a, one of these like surgeries, but she claimed that it was to, I mean, I think part of it was that she, she says that she was always very insecure about the appearance, but yeah. she also had a lot of pain, like when mm -hmm. she would like ride a bicycle or something. Yeah. So that can happen. And I do talk about that. Like there are conditions where the labia minora is so long that women are like, it's uncomfortable. It chafes. Like if I'm doing certain activities or during sex, it gets pulled inside and that feels uncomfortable, which on the flip side, because of how, so the labia minora comes up and it meets the clitoral hood, which is a little hood that covers over the clitoris. Because of that, they're pulling, like pulling on those, not like tugging friends, but like that pool, that that gentle movement may actually stimulate the clitoris, which is why some women may say like, oh, it actually is more pleasurable. Like I enjoy that. And so this comes back to like what's true for your body. Because if you, so one, if you're feeling so insecure about that, it's kind of like, I grew up at a time where like Pamela Anderson is like what we should aspire to be. Like our breasts should be like double D's. Um, and so you see everybody go that route and and you watch these things. I think the Kardashians are like the best example, right? Like Kim Kardashian was very, very curvy and now things are shifting. Like, and I'm not like, I don't understand her plastic surgery or, you know, I'm not going to say, but things shifted and things changed and things are getting smaller now. And we're seeing that whole movement back to like back in the day, Kate Moss body. And mm. so we have to be mindful. Are we chasing trends? And like, what is this really rooted in? And if we are like, oh my God, this is like destroying my mental health and meeting with a mental health provider and meeting with an expert who you can, so I would say plastic surgeon who's board certified to talk about that surgery, to talk about what are you hoping to be the outcomes. And you may find that 
this is what's right for you. And it may be a situation as well where you have hypertrophy, so that tissue is just too much for you and you do need to have some of it removed. But I think it's very problematic when it is a, let's just remove it all together. Like let's cut it down as, as little as possible. When we don't under, we just figured out like the, cl the clitoris has 10,000 nerve endings. Like we're just making these discoveries. But then we've got people with knives getting all willy nilly down there without actually asking like, well, what could the potential impact of this be? Hmm. I mean, in my non-expert, like from my non-expert perspective on this, it would make sense to me that the labia minora would be tissue wise analogous to like the skin of the scrotum, mm -hmm. which doesn't, I mean, to me, it do that doesn't have like a ton of nerve endings, mm -hmm. but you're saying that it's like, it's still connected to the underlying the legs of the clitoris and that oh, it can no it's that the tissue comes up and it meets the clitoral hood and so for anybody who doesn't know there's a clitoral hood and i have i have beautiful drawings i had this um beautiful artist who hand drew all of the anatomy drawings in the book and so showing the vulva showing the clitoral hood and so there's a piece of skin that goes over the clitoris and it can retract so you can pull it back yourself or it retracts during arousal and that is connected so at the very top that is going to be connected to the labia minora that's where it comes up and it joins got it so yeah. how do we how do we facilitate how do we close this gap. Mm -hmm. How do we facilitate more orgasms for our, for our female listeners? Yeah. So, okay. There's a lot of tricks I could give you, but one thing is that having her orgasm first. So there's research and there's lots of women who will tell you that if she orgasms first, then she's more likely to have an orgasm once there is penetration. And so, and it makes things more lubricated. The tissue is even more aroused. So we'll see um, that the, the, so what happens is there's tenting where your anatomy actually makes way for a penis. So the uterus moves back. And so the, the whole vaginal canal changes so that it can accommodate a penis, making it more comfortable and helping with exposing the clitoris as well. So having her orgasm first, and maybe that's oral sex, maybe that is, you know, uh, digitally, maybe you're bringing a toy in. You might want to use toys during vaginal sex. If that's the goal is to have vaginal penetration, cock rings, people love those. There's also lots of hand-free toys, which is, I think, amazing to see more disabled people get access to pleasure as well. So there's lots of these hand-free toys that no matter where you're at, you can utilize these. And then there's also positions. So one trick is to, if you if you want to be a missionary, you can put a pillow underneath the hips so that it elevates the pelvis and it exposes things further. But I would say number one thing is, is communicate. Mm. So as I'm saying all of this, ask her what she likes, ask her how she likes it. Um, if you're not a clitoris owner, then usually, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to come in and I'm going to tap it or I'm going to go really fast. Whereas what the research says is women like a rhythmic motion, usually circular or back and forth and not just, you know, like a finger poking, but maybe using multiple fingers, using a hand. But the key is that rhythmic motion and starting slow and low. And then building up if that's what she likes. But having that communication is really important. And as I share in the book, we know from the research that people like spicy talk, and that is a big turn on for a lot of people. So whenever people are like, oh, I have to talk about sex, that's weird. You don't have to make it weird. Hmm. You can say sexy things and like that's gonna get your partner even more aroused. Fascinating. What are, what are some of the barriers to to communication? Because to me, it's not, it seems super intuitive. Like. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I like to think of myself as a really good communicator and very attentive and, you know, like hyper conscious of like what the other person that I'm with is experiencing yeah. in the act. But like there are couples out there, people that where there's like a barrier. Mm -hmm. Well, say? I think there's a lot of ego that sometimes comes into it because there is this um, and I don't write about this in the book. This somebody needs to write like all about this book uh, is that men have an expectation on them. Like they're supposed to perform in the bedroom, right? So they're supposed to be able to like master that vagina, uh, <laughs> smash that vagina. Like think about the language that's used. It's <laughs> like, I'm going to tear that up. I'm going to dominate that. Like, um, and there is this pressure that like they're just supposed to be good at sex. Like, and she's just supposed to like that, right? Like, <laughs> and the reality is, is that like, unless you ask the person you're with, you have no way to know. You're just like fumbling in the 
dark, which you are sometimes fumbling in the dark. But um, I think that's a big part of it is that, you know, there can be this ego and the ego isn't like, oh, I'm so good. And I think that there's a lot of people that like to go there like men are just trash. And it's not that as much as they're like, I feel really insecure and now I feel like I'm being called out in that. Um, or women are faking orgasms. There's hmm. a big <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I've a, heard that. Oh my gosh, I had to read the audiobook and I talk about um when Harry met Sally. Oh my gosh. Okay, and there's that scene in the cafe. Uh you don't know this? Oh, uh, when Harry met Sally. When Harry met Sally, she fakes an orgasm in the cafe. Oh yeah, of course. That's yeah. an iconic scene. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you're shaking yeah. your head no at me. And no, so I'm having a moment here of like I, I welcome I'm the only one that knows this. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say I don't think I've ever seen the, the movie start to finish, but that No, everybody's is, seen the scene though. Yeah, right? everybody's seen the scene. I don't yeah. I think I tried to watch the Meg movie. Meg Ryan. Scene. Meg Ryan. Yeah. Yeah. So, she was um, really hottie. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I had to like act out the yas. Like, I was reading the audiobook and I got to that and I was like, how do I do this? And the, the producer's like, you need to do it. Like, mm. you need to be like doing the yes, yes. And so I'm like, how do I strike it between like, not a porn star, uh, but not totally a doctor? Like, where's the in between here <laughs> of like this thing? But, um, oh, there's a lot of women, uh, that are faking orgasms and, People will often say like, oh, it's because he's not good or it's because it's something negative when in reality, it's very altruistic. Like they want him to feel good about himself. Like they're doing it because they want him to feel like everything society has told him to be, which is problematic, right? Like sometimes women like, look. We've all been there. Sometimes we just want it over with. Sometimes things hurt and you don't want to talk about pain in the moment because then that becomes a whole thing and that's a turn off. And like, it's very complicated, right? Because whoever told us how to talk about all this, like whoever, did your parents, like if you were in, in like the Netherlands, your parents would have sat you down. Like you would have had these classes. You would have been learning about consent when you were like four years old. Mm. Like same thing in Germany, but here in the United States, it's like, we don't talk about that. Like we're not supposed to talk about that. And if your doctor doesn't talk to you about it and the sex ed teacher doesn't talk about it and your parents don't, like where do you get this information? Enter Dr. Brighton on her Google being like, oh, um, that's not the website I intended to come up right now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, I've heard that it's a good, I mean, it, it it can be used to make the guy feel good about themselves, but also uh, often it's used as like an, a, an escape button. Mm -hmm. It can be. Yeah. Because right? like, there, I mean, there's definitely times that where it's like, this is so bad. Like, I don't even know where to start right no. now kind of situation. Um, definitely can be made worse by being under the influence of, you know, really anything. But alcohol is one where doctors will tell women like, oh, you're having pain with sex. Like, have some lube, have some wine. Like, you know, you'll be okay. But the reality is, is that so alcohol for him, not great. For women, it actually can desensitize things, makes orgasm more difficult, makes sexual arousal. So tissues not getting engorged, is not getting wet. Like, that can all become more problematic. And so there's those situations as well, right? Because I don't want to go down the path of like, this is just all men kind mm. of situation where it's like, well, there can be other things going on as well. And then sometimes it is just that guy and like you, you just need to exit and you do need the escape button. Yeah, I guess helpful in that, in that context. What, if you're a guy, what should you do? Like, what's the best way to like, to ask, you mm. know, because I'm sure there are some guys that are listening that are like, well, I don't want it to be awkward, you know? Like, yeah, totally. So, yeah. So what's the best way to, to, to initiate that conversation? Say you're like in the act. Yeah. Do you like this? Does it feel good? Do you want more of this? How would you like it if I bit? Like, how would you like it if I licked? How would you like it, you know? Just like that. It's pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. But it is definitely something that um, you're right, though. Like, we don't have a language around it. And it's like, I will also say you don't want to be overly checking in. It's like, uh, I've heard this from patients before, too, about the whole consent, where it's like, we need to ask for consent. Like consent is really important in, and it goes both ways. However, there are sometimes those people that are like, are you okay if I do this? Are you okay if I do that? Are you okay? And um, it becomes less enthusiastic. And now we've like, now we're like in gray town of like, is this actually consent? Cause they're not enthusiastic about it. And so you don't want to like overdo it. And also if you find something that's working, do that. And I would say with women, make sure you're also like, you basically, you gotta be like, you know, on the, on the tarmac, like given directions, like it's a, you're landing a plane here. Like you've got to do that sometimes because especially in new relationships, it's a new body. And while bodies have similarities, what we like is different. And that is also normal. I think that's another piece where people are like, 
for example, women will write me and say, I'm really into sex on my period. Like I really am in the mood on my period. Is that normal? I'm like, it's totally normal. Um, but my boyfriend thinks it's weird because he's like, I've never been with a girl who's like that. I'm like, let's talk about hormones. <laughs> let's talk mm. about like why that's totally normal. And also it's totally normal if you're not. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, as a, as a guy, like I, I love like when, a, when a girl communicates and tells me like indicates what she's into, what she's not into, like, it's like throwing me a bone, you know, like <laughs> totally so that I'm not, so I'm not just like shooting in the dark. No mm -hmm. pun intended, you know, like this is the punniest episode you've probably <laughs> ever done. Um, Can I open this? Yeah. Open okay. It. Cause I didn't open it before yeah, yeah, and yeah. I'm like, it's going to do the. No, no, no. It's all good. It's okay. all good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so fellas, like, don't, you know, do not be afraid to ask. And then also conversely for women, like, don't, you know, like, like mm -hmm. help, help the fella out, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think in any relationship, having that kind of communication is super important. And, I mean, <laughs> I say it so many times in the book, like, two things, communication and lube. Uh, lube is good for everyone. Uh, and, like, I, um, I get people all the time who are like, well, there's something wrong with him if I need lube. Or you see men, I saw this like going viral online where this man's like, if she's not getting wet, she's not the one. I'm like, and you're not the one. Like, what are you saying? Like, you're really telling on yourself right now? But also, you know, in the book I say like a lube-free bedroom is where good sex goes to die. Like, mm. there are phases of our menstrual cycle. So before your period, you are more likely to be dry because of progesterone and estrogen taking a backseat to that. And that is is normal. Needing more lube around then is normal. Having the so-called WAP when you're ovulating, totally normal. <laughs> the WAP. The what, WAP. <laughs> what are the, what are the, I mean, because we're on the topic, what are the best and safest, uh, most vulva and vagina friendly lubes? Mm. Well, so silicone is a really great one for shower sex. And if you are wanting to go the distance, um, which by the way, people always think like, you want to be having like these long sessions of sex and yeah, people in the research report that like, that's not it. That's not what they want. They want pleasure, but they don't necessarily need that like, you know, stallion marathon action. And those were women respondents that yes. said that. So it's a misconception that women just want you to be able to go forever. Yes. Yes. Um, so the other thing about silicone is it's great for anal sex. It is like the go-to for that. When it comes to vulva vagina, um, looking at water-based lubes, those will dry out faster. So it just depends. Like, do you want to reapply? Some people find reapplying lube sexy. Some people have mini fridges in their bedroom and find a chilled lube to be like arousing because that's a new sensation, right? Like some people bring ice cubes in, like you can have chilled lube. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. What about, what about oil-based? So oil-based, not so good for condoms. All right. Those are going to break down condoms, but, um, oil-based. So coconut oil is the most common used ones that are made for the vulva i have patients who swear by it um people get afraid because they're like well it's slightly antimicrobial so it might disrupt the vaginal microbiome and yet i've had patients who have had you know chronic yeast issues that come up after sex and they're like that's the lube for me like it actually helps and it, hel it helps with that so it really just depends on what's true for you but a lot of people love oil based the only problem that i say uh, other than the condoms is the sheets like it's going to stain your sheets but mm. it is one that um a lot of people like because not only is it long lasting but it is a good lubricant Co oil coconut oil well, the coconut oil, so there's lots of, when you see the oil-based lubes, it's usually the coconut oil that they're using, maybe yeah. some jojoba mixed in there, some vitamin E. Hmm. So it doesn't like, uh, it's not, it's not weird. It's like use it under normal circumstances. It's not weird. Like it's not, it's totally normal and actually can like you be used to enhance sex. Yes. Yeah. Lube is totally normal. And that's the, I mean... Whenever I see, like, there's just so many things that I see and I hear from men. And then I'm like, you really are just telling me how little you know about the female <laughs> body. Like, and I'm going to help you out here. Um, but let's never speak of this again. Like, don't go and say that. Where they shame women for needing lube. Um, so depending on your life phase, like, so like postpartum. Where are your hormones? Like you need your hormones, but they're gone. They left you with that placenta. And so things are drier. That's normal. You would need lubrication. And if you ever have pain with sex... You, you know, you may be getting over it, but there's going to be that little, like, I don't want it to hurt again. You have repeated pain with sex. You're going to find ways to avoid that because that's what organisms do. They don't want pain. And so that's something else we want to avoid is that we want it to be pleasurable and lube can absolutely help with that.
And last thing I'll say is that there is a phenomenon known as arousal non-concordance, which is where your brain is super into it, but the genitals are not getting the memo. And mm. so they're not lubricating the way that they should be. And so with that, you're like, I'm ready. And your partner's like, are you sure? Are you sure what's going on? Like consent is a brain phenomenon, not a genital phenomenon. So if brain says yes, it's a yes. If genitals are like ready to go, but brain says no, it's a no. It's a no. What about uh, chemicals that are sometimes used in, in lube that mm -hmm. might not be might not be the best? I mean, we already talked about kind of like oil and it's coconut oil specifically and it's antimicrobial properties. But what about like I feel like a lot of lubes will contain parabens yeah. and fragrances and things like that. No, 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 no. That is something that like it is an endocrine disruptor on mucosal tissue. Like we can deliver hormones and it is well absorbed in the on on the vulva in the vagina itself. Like these these endocrine disruptors. So for people who don't know, endocrine disruptors or EDCs, they're chemicals that will mimic your hormones, dock onto the same receptors or block your hormones. They're they're called, and I will see people say, is it really that big of a deal? Do they really mess with your hormones? I'm like, I didn't name them endocrine disruptors. Mm -hmm. I did not name them this. Yes. So you definitely want to avoid those things. Glycerin, if you are prone to yeast infections, that is not your friend. So glycerin is not a great thing to have in there. It's just a sugar that they'll sometimes put in lubes, not necessary. And then we come to vaginal melts and- Melts? Um, yes. What's that? Yeah. So um, it's, I often think about the um, little candy discs they use for melting and making like little um, in, in the molds, but these melts are to be inserted so that you taste like a creamsicle. Like, so you taste like something yummy. I mean, I hate to break it to you, but vaginas are supposed to smell and taste like vaginas. They hmm. have signature scents and, and flavors, like, but people use vaginal melts. They'll use all kinds of things things um like flavored lubes those are going to have sugars those are going to disrupt your microbiome no two ways about it and that's usually going to lead you to a yeast infection is what we commonly see yeah you don't want to put sugar in the vagina no we don't and then like i have a whole like red light green light of like what goes in the vagina and what doesn't and the things that i list my editor was reading it and she's like for real and i'm like yes patients have told me like headphones like putting putting ear like ear uh ear pods in there and playing music like doing all these different things people are very creative i think that's amazing that you're having such a good time but i'm like you know putting like an entire you know piece of produce in there probably not a good idea like and uh, you know it's something that i preface and i, I always preface this like i am not going to shame you if you are having a good time, like I am all for that. But I want to warn you, you may end up in the ER having a very awkward conversation. And as much as I would like to be like, these professionals will not giggle. They're going to giggle at some point because everybody giggles about sex. <laughs> everybody. Yeah. I mean, sex is kind of funny. Yeah, it does, definitely is. <laughs> does performing cunnilingus offer probiotic benefits? Oh, that's a great question. And I so um, if you don't know, women's health research is really lacking. And then we got sexual health when it comes to women, very much lacking. I have actually wondered this myself. Like, what if you have a partner who has, um, you know, they have bacteria that predisposes them to like inflammation, to um, having caries, so uh, having cavities. Like, how is that going to affect you? In my mind, I want to imagine like the whole ecology of the vagina just like basically coming in and throwing throwing down and being like, you shall not pass. Like you're <laughs> not coming in here. But like, we know how important oral health is for like cardiovascular health, for pregnancy, fertility. I mean, we're going to find so much more about brain health. I mean, the mouth is super important and people should know you can pass HPV. Um, I actually had somebody who was like, okay, if you're saying HPV is sexually contracted, but my partner has only been with me and I've only been with them, how could we both have HPV? And I'm like, who did they kiss? Who did they kiss? Because HPV can live in the oral cavity. And this is why a lot of good dentists, everybody listening, if your dentist is not doing a head and neck exam, like you ask them to do it because they should and they should be checking for that because just like you can develop cervical cancer, you can develop cancer in the head and neck because of HPV. Wow. And HPV is is super common, is it not? Super common. Yeah. HPV and herpes are super common. Um, and I think that's just important for people to know because there's a lot of shame and stigma. But odds are you know somebody who has it. Hmm. What about um, people that have like uh, alternate sexual tastes, if you want to call it that, like kinks and things like that? How do, How are those best brought up? to uh to a significant other 
Ah, <laughs> is this a personal question? <laughs> well, I'm teasing. You don't have to answer. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm just wondering because I feel like, you know, it's one thing to like, we want to close that, that orgasm gap. Mm -hmm. But I feel like there are probably people out there who are not, who even despite or, you know, being able to orgasm aren't getting necessarily what they want mm -hmm. from their partner. So how is that like, a, you know, I feel like that could be a potentially awkward, difficult conversation. To yeah, have. I mean, possibly, but it is just the same thing as before. I mean, you can have a conversation with your partner. There should always be consent. And this is true for women, too, of bringing toys into the bedroom um, of like, are you OK with this? Hey, I'd like to try this out. What do you think about that? Um, this is something I th and I think coming from a place of this is something I feel would bring me immense pleasure. Like, I really want to experience this. What do you think about that? Like, are you into that? And having that on honest conversation, I think before the act is definitely better. But if not, if you're going into the act and you're like, Spanking is super common. So people call these things kinks. And, and you know, the reality is, is that like one in five people have engaged in what is considered kink. So what is a kink? Yeah. I mean, when we talk about kinks, you know, what people start categorizing things as like anything that's not like the vanilla sex, right? <laughs> like the, the uh, you know, the cis heterosexual, um, you know, missionary position kind of thing like that people get in their mind. So I say it that way because people define kinks in a lot of different ways. Like they're like, oh, that's kink, that's kink. Um, and it's, you know, they can include things that are fetishes. It can include like BDSM, which people often get wrong thanks to like Fifty Shades of Grey that you have to be like emotionally damaged. Damage to like be into this, which is not the case in most of the BDSM community. Um, it can be voyeurism, like you like watching, you like being watched. And so there's a lot of things that we kind of throw into that bucket. Spanking is one of those things. And so in the moment, sometimes people will say, so you shouldn't just spank your partner, um, but you can, you can like start rubbing the, you know, their ass and you can say like, hey, I'd like to spank you. Would you be into that? Start gentle. Make sure that it's okay. Um, just just like when you're working the clitoris, start low and slow. If you are super excited and you just want to like full on hand back and like slap, start slow. Like hold off on that because maybe they would be into that. But if they're not into that, well, you're you're done. Hmm. Your session's over. And so it's things like that where people are like, oh, that's a little bit out. I think so many of us think like, oh, these things are outside the box. But do you realize that um, once the door is closed, people, they don't have boxes. They have like swimming pools. <laughs> like they have like, these huge arenas like of things that they're into that sometimes they don't even, you know, your partner may not even know that they're like into that until you're getting into the act. And then their brain's like, hey, hey, what about this thing? And so having those, again, it's it's just like anything else. Like, can I touch you there? Like, is this okay? Like, um, you know, if somebody consents to something, don't take a mile. Like if they gave you an inch, don't take a mile. Like you can work your way up to that. And then afterwards, have a conversation. Hmm. How was that for you? Were you into that? Um, they might tell you like, yeah, you know, I wasn't really into that. Like, and maybe if we tried this instead, you may just find that you both are really into something that your brain hadn't even thought of yet. Wow. And when is the best time to bring something like that up? Is it like when you're actually like in the bedroom or is it like over dinner or something when you're in the kitchen hanging out? Yeah. I mean, that's going to be about your relationship and how you already communicate about sex. I you know, as an educator, I'm like, before the bedroom, please. Like, um, especially if it's going to involve things like bondage and and things that um, my, that really ask somebody to be very vulnerable. Mm. And so in the moment like that, they might consent to something um, and be excited about it and then not realize how, how, like they can say no and, or, and how to get out of that. And so having that conversation before can help you understand like, what are the limits? What are the boundaries here? What are we hoping to get out of this? And how do we know when it's not working? Like do, so people will talk about safe words. Um, but you know, it's also about just checking in and not just relying on like, if you're the person who's like, I really want to try this thing and your partner's consenting to it, not just being like, well, they consented to it. So I'm just going to go like no matter what. Hmm. So before time, before, you know, you get in the bedroom or wherever <laughs> with the car um, or anywhere <laughs> else, um, having that conversation ahead of time so that you really can have the, the parameters and the ground runs because you also don't want to both be thinking you're consenting to the same thing and then being on different pages. Hmm. What if you have a partner that's like not on the same sexual wavelength as you? Mm -hmm. What do you do then? Yeah. So what do you mean? Do you mean not on the same sexual wavelength because they're not into what you're into or they don't want to have sex as often as you? Or yeah. How do you find maybe, maybe a little bit of both. Yeah. You know? 
Well, okay. So if they don't want to have sex as often as you, that could be a situation of how their desire is set up. So there is um, what's been defined as responsive and spontaneous desire. And so spontaneous is what we usually characterize men as. But again, this puts pressure on men that isn't totally fair, but that's like brain is always on sex. Mm. Um, you're just like constantly scanning the environment for sex and you could just go at the drop of a dime. And then you've got responsive desire, which is what a lot of people think of as like, oh, I have low libido. Like I'm just not into it. And with responsive desire, that's usually, I say, you got to get going before you get going. And so the brain might be like, fake it or leave it, I don't care. But once you're engaged, things are moving in the right direction, the brain's like, I care. I care a lot. Like, let's do this now. Um, this is sometimes like when I'm talking to patients and they're like, you know, like sometimes I just do it even though I'm tired, I don't want to. And I'm like, and then how does it feel? And they're like, it's really good. And I'm like, so consider that. Like if you're, if you're like, you know, okay, is it going to be good? Like, am I going to be into this? Like, yeah, okay. So maybe I just, I'm, you know, going with it now and I can always say no. So this kind of thing, this is the mismatch we see often is that you've got one partner who's like, yeah, let's go all the time. And then you've got another partner that's like, I need to be like worked into that. Like mm. I'm not going to automatically just initiate sex. I'm not running sex all the time. Um, and in the book, I have a 28 day plan where I actually have you charting and mapping out like your sex life based on your cyclical self. So going across your menstrual cycle. And what a lot of people find is that, you know, I am more into sex like around ovulation. So like that's a key time of like where I might want to experiment with more stuff. So as you were talking about like, Someone who's not as into something, uh, you know, as their partner and their partner's like, oh, I want to try spanking as an example. I want to try bringing a toy in the room. Around ovulation might be the time to be like, hey, why don't we just give this a try? I might be more into it. It's easier for me to have an orgasm. Like I might be more into it around this time because of where my hormones are at. But, you know, if you're trying to initiate that when progesterone is up during the luteal phase, when you're like your hormones are already being like, look, we already did the egg thing. We don't need sex right now. <laughs> um, that's the other thing to recognize uh, that a lot of men miss is that there is this cycle of like and there's been researchers to say like around ovulation is like this you know, six ish day of a sexual phase of like women are going to be more into it. We ovulate then progesterone rises. And when progesterone rises, it is like, I would rather get into sweatpants than into their pants kind of hormone. <laughs> and so recognize that's when like a male partner will be like, she was so into me and now she's not into me. And like, we're mismatched. What's going on? It's like her hormones just shifted. And so now at this point, now instead of just focusing, because the, always the focus is like, how do I like, ex like turn on the accelerator? So there's the sexual excitation and inhibition model. And so everybody wants to be like Marvin Gaye, lingerie, candles, like what excites us. But most women will not receive that signal if you have not dampened the inhibition. And so inhibition could be poor body image issues. So we talked about that earlier on. Um, so this is always the thing where like as women – um, I will, I, you know, I have them tell me like, oh, I'm, I'm watching myself and I'm thinking, can they see my cellulite while we're doing it? Like this, that, and that's sp spectatoring. Very, very common, very uh, normal behavior to fall into given our society. Mm. And yet at the same time, nobody's looking at your cellulite. Nobody, like you're in that position. You're wondering, do they see my roles? No. They do not because literally their hormones are flooding their brain just being like sex, sex, sex. <laughs> like they're not seeing anything. But yeah, so accurate. Accurate. Um, so their inhibition, that can look like things and men – please don't roll your eyes, uh, like picking up your underwear and making them into the laundry basket, uh, making sure that like you're task sharing in the house. So these are the non-sexy things that go a long way in sex because they're releasing breaks for her. So if you think about it, if you're going, if she's going through her day and, uh, you, she had asked you to run an errand or do something and you're like, yeah, I'll do that for you. But you don't break hmm. like you've just put a break in and let's just say this is like a neuronal pathway right okay so break then she's like hey can you pick up dinner on the way home like i'd really love thai food and you're like yeah sorry pizza was closer like i just got that instead like break um or you didn't do it all together um and then there's something where she's like you know i really need to talk to you i'm like feeling all this stress and you're just like yeah not now i want to watch the baseball game break okay so these are kind of like more extreme things but we've just added all these breaks now you put the sexy signal so you come up to her in the kitchen you start grabbing on her you know she loves it when you kiss her neck 
that can't make it on that neuronal pathway. The brain is like, I can't even hear that because there's so much static and I feel so stressed right now. And mm. so for people to understand that sometimes it's an issue that we like, and fixing your hormones is way easier than like working on your relationship. Okay. As somebody who's married, it is way easier. I'm like a hormone doctor who's married. Um, give me hormones any day. Working on your relationship is like, okay, like this is like two people cohabitating. Like we have to figure out the dance and have conversations that are sometimes hard. Like everybody goes through that. Hmm. But I think that's probably why women tend to, speaking as a non-woman, but like, you know, I think it's pretty colloquially understood that women's fantasies tend to be more contextual, whereas men's fantasies are more like, I just want to sleep with that mm -hmm. or that or that. Whereas women, you know, there's more like, yeah, there's more, there's more context involved. It's like the rose petals leading to the bed, you know, I mean, maybe that's like a cheesy example, but like, would you say that that's kind of, you know, accurate? I mean, sometimes, and, but I think what, so something we have to like recognize is that like, you're asking to enter someone's body. Like that's a very vulnerable position to be in. Right. And so if we want good sex, we have to we have to tell that body we're safe. And so that's going to look like so everything that I was saying, like feeling taken care of, um, having those consent talks, all of those things, but also helping her get out of that fight or flight. Right. So if she's bananas stressed out from her life, helping her with that, because that cortisol is going to be like, not now, honey, mm. I am I don't I'm not feeling good. And so there are some women who have fantasies about, you know, the rose petals and, you know, the whole like I think what we what we think of from the media. There's other women who are having fantasies about threesomes. They don't want a threesome. They're not interested in doing that, but that's where their fantasies are going. And so mm. um, but women's fantasies, they are very interesting and around ovulation, there there's many more fantasies. So that's where we're thinking about sex more. We're fantasizing about sex more. What are some of the more common female fantasies? Do you have any data on that? You know who is great uh, for that is Justin Lay Miller. He has a whole book on this and he did a bunch. He's at the Kinsey Institute, which is like mm. the masters of Johnson and Masters, the masters of uh, sexual health. And he has done a ton of work. Now, these are these have to be surveys when it comes to research, right? Like you can't mm. get in people's brains about these right. um, of asking about the, the different fantasies that people have. So I would definitely recommend that his book is tell me what you want i would definitely recommend that to get the breakdown on just all the ways that fantasies play out and it's just it's um a lot of people like i said the threesome thing is something that people when you know people will come to me and sometimes this happens at like cocktail parties baby showers these kinds of things and they're just like okay so like I, I have this fantasy and is this, is this weird? And I'm like, it's not weird at all. Whatever you fantasize is not weird. And being in your head, sometimes people, so um, fantasizing about being with other people, I say this in the book, I know someone's going to come for me, but if you're having sex and you're fantasizing about other people, it doesn't mean you're cheating on them. And mm. I know some people are going to hate hearing that. It doesn't mean that you are cheating. Um, but if you are just having sex with this person and you only think about other people, then you have to ask, are you just using this person? Like, is this just a means to an end mm. kind of situation? Interesting. From my vantage point, I mean, I know a lot of women or I know I've spoken to women who have had fantasies about rape. They've mm -hmm. had fantasies about... Um, being just ravished by the pool boy or the, you know, whatever. It's just like them being overtaken by this mm -hmm. dominant male yeah. energy. And my male friends, when I when they talk about their fantasies, it's usually like, oh, yeah, I would love to sleep with her yeah, or her or her. Yeah, I mean, we – our brains, they're wired a little differently. They work a little <laughs> – like, yeah, I think um, there's a reason why romance novels, like, target women and, like – man, romance book talk, like on TikTok, like I didn't even know, like these, <laughs> I'm like, now I might want to read romance novels. It's, <laughs> it's interesting that like what would be taboo to talk about 10 years ago is now super common, mm. commonplace. Like people were talking about it on, there was a TikTok trend that I saw not too long ago where women were showing off like their bruises or something from like rough really? sex. Not, yeah. I mean, I think like there was a lot I did of, not end up on this side of TikTok. <laughs> yeah. It was like, it was like controversial, but, mm -hmm. um, 
but you know, like even on Netflix, there's a docu series that I that I saw. I actually started watching it. It was pretty boring, actually. But <laughs> um, like I, I thought it was a major missed opportunity. But some woman who specializes in, d- in designing sexual dungeons. Oh yes. For couples. I came across that because my son was like, "What is this?" Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, "You're on the wrong Netflix account." Like, yeah. It's pretty. Uh, it's pretty PG. Mm. But it's just interesting that the, that that sexual you know kinks, so to speak, have gone mm-hmm. mainstream. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, a lot of people look at Fifty Shades of Grey. I mean, that blew up, blew up, and it was so. And telling. why did it blow up? It was like that fantasy, right, of like mm-hmm. the, of the woman being sort of overtaken. Yeah, but there was also like that, like broken male trope, and like she comes in and she fixes him. Mm. Like, oh, that's such a played out story. Um, I have a lot of issues with Fifty Shades of Grey. If you can't tell, oh, the author will probably ne- never hear this. Have you read version. the book? I have not. Again, uh, I'm like, I just, what am I doing with my life? Reading <laughs> science. Like, I could be like, I don't know. For me, it was like Fabio was the romance archetype, you know, back in the, the day. The gym that I go to, Fabio works out there. It's really Stop funny. I see it. him all the time. Oh yeah. my God. He still looks good. Oh, good for him. Yeah. 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 But it was like, also, um, he was selling fake butter for a while. So I don't know. Like, could we be friends? Oh, I don't know. Man. Like, how could I fantasize a man who's like, hey, hate, hate your body? <laughs> like, he did not know what he <laughs> he was like he was on the cover of like all the romance novels, the mm-hmm. trashy like supermarket. Yeah, for yeah. like a decade or so. Yeah, at least. I like that you were used the word trashy because I'm like that is something that was like you know I think that romance novels have come a long way, but I think there is something that there's an allure to like the trashy romance novel. Like I'm gonna get wine and a bubble bath and a trashy romance novel, and that does it for some people. Hmm. So is this normal? What are some other topics that you cover in the book? I mean, it's like, uh, it's a beautiful book and it's uh, definitely one that people should check out. But like, what are some other, um, you know, areas that that you felt compelled to write about? Tell me what you notice on the cover. Well, there's what appears to be, uh, well, it's either a vagina or a butthole <laughs> or a mouth. Oh, so you you uh, you identified it right away. You're like, is this a vulva? So when they they wanted like um, my publishers, they were like, we want this really like plain typeface, and I and they were like, oh, let's make the O falling down or like stuff that was like, no, that doesn't jive with me. And I was like, why don't we make the O a vulva? Mm. I do have to say, I knew I was dealing with a male designer when it came back, and I was <laughs> like, sir, that's not a vulva. Um, <laughs> what is this? And we had to get on a call. There was a whole conversation about the vulva on the cover of my book, and. As it turned out, he was a man. Well, it's pretty um, subtle. Yes, yes. It it's, is, a, it's a really well designed, you know, because it's like yeah, less it, is more. It's supposed to be subtle. It's, yeah. a, it's supposed to make you be like, wait, is that a vulva? Like hit, vulvas in the wild. They're mm. just hidden everywhere. Um, but then you also said, is this a butthole? And yes, there's a, a whole section about anal sex, which is on the rise. And we know in the United States, heterosexual couples are now talking about it more, that they are engaging in anal sex. Which Why is, is that? Uh, so well, it's very interesting how some people are like, it's the Kardashian effect of like butts are in. And I'm like, I don't know if it's about that as much as like, this is something that's been taboo and taboo is usually exciting to humans. Like that we're not supposed to do this. Like a lot of fantasies come from there as well. And I think that people are just wanting to experiment more. And we've seen a lot of the sodomy laws have been dropped. So, hmm. um, yeah, states were outlawing this for a while. That's like, insane to me. It is insane the amount of policing that happens on our bodies. Yeah. Like, it's insane. That is crazy. Those laws never should have existed. No, no. And they were really, like, anti-homosexual. But then, like, but, like heterosexual couples are doing this too like everybody has a butthole i have to have to break it to you even certain animals i think like certain primates Mm -hmm. will do it yeah yeah and there's um so i talk about like you know analingus some people like to have oral sex with the anus um fingering of the anus so uh you know digital stimulation and then penetration um which you know that so people know when i say digital that could be on the outside or there could be penetration and i talk through like a lot of the myths but also how to do it safely um i'm all about like if you want to do something let's just make sure it's safe because there's a lot of myths that go around so Uh, the biggest one is that I'll hear from women, their partners saying, well, you can't get an STI if we do it this way. I just have to laugh because I'm like, nice try. Uh, nice try with that. Um, you know, or like saying things like, oh, well, this means that you're still a virgin. Um, and if we do it any other way, you're like not a virgin. And so this is a way to keep your virginity. By the way, I break it down in the book. That's not a thing. Medically Mm -hmm. speaking, scientifically speaking, 
There is no platform for virginity to stand on that is completely a construct of our our society. Um, Fe, you know, it's super interesting that I learned probably a couple couple years you're excited. ago. Excited, I'm excited for this. You're like super interesting. I'm like, yes. Well, okay. we associate the presence of a hymen uh, with virginity. Yes, but that's a completely made up human construct. The yeah. hymen's role is. You want to share? Yeah. So the hymen is actually protecting the vagina. And as we age, the it's going to thin. It also can, <laughs> there can be no hymen um, even present at the time that you have sex the first time. And with that, I think a lot of people, um, when they talk about like popping the cherry, like breaking her hymen, what they yeah. don't understand is that it's it stretches. It's a tissue that gives. So that may never actually happen. So these like like T.I., the rapper T.I., um, and these other men who are like, we have to do virginity mm. checks. I'm like, that's not a thing. Does she ride a horse? <laughs> like, did she like fall? Like, um, there's a movie, it's a cult classic, Chasing Amy, and uh, she talks about how like she fell at the playground as a child and like broke her hymen. So was she not a virgin then? Mm. Like, is that the moment she was no longer a virgin? Yeah, but the hymen has, I mean, yeah, it's it has, it's not there to mark you know, the occasion of first sexual intercourse. As far as I know, I, when I when I read up on this, it literally is there to protect the vagina from in infancy mm -hmm. to prevent fecal matter yep. from entering the vagina. Yep. That's its purpose. It's there for safety mm -hmm. and hygiene. And then, you know, it goes away at some point. But we yeah. have this like weird asso puritanical association. And it's also very male-centered. Of right. like, oh, the vagina is preserved for a man and it's only once a man has like deflowered her or broken her hymen like she she no longer has value um there's like there's a lot it's very problematic all of it um so you're absolutely right like the hymen doesn't serve any male purpose um and it's like it's not it's not a measure of whether or not you're a virgin and a doctor can't look and can't know hmm. like we have no way to know whether or not that you have had sex at all um so yes the hymen the hymen piece is very uh, it's very problematic that that myth still persists is it would you say it's becoming more uh it's, it's like becoming more niche like more fringe no i don't think it mm. is really i mean every time i talk about it there's just definitely people who come at me and are just like you're wrong and you don't know and i'm like sure i don't know um what like where'd you get your degree <laughs> like yeah, explain it to me again but i think that um and i will hear from a lot of women i get a lot of dms from women who are like talking about God, talking about Allah, talking about like how this is how they intended. And I'm like, I will never argue your beliefs because I respect those. Those are your beliefs. But you don't get to take your belief and place it on someone else. And you also don't get to take your belief and tell me that the science about this is wrong because that you have this other belief. Like that, that it's just very harmful. And I know a lot of women have beaten themselves up about it who have thought like, you know, there's there's some negative thing about them because they had sex. And I think that, um, you know, as you were saying, it's about that purity, that whole kind of purity conversation, which only is for women. Like we don't put that same conversation on men. It's really toxic. I mean, I, we, I, I definitely think that we should have we ought to have reverence for sex because it is a it is a beautiful and, and precious thing. But um, but it also is a very natural part of life. Mm -hmm. And I think like you only live once, so you should have experience. You should have all the kinds of sexual experiences that you want to have, you know. Yeah, and and not ascribe to a life based on on dogma on somebody else's truth. Absolutely. Well, I think that's the secret to a happy life: is ask what's true for you, do what's true for you. If you're not harming anyone else, like do what is making you happy. Yeah. Um. I talk about so there's a chapter. The very first chapter is sex, is what it says, and it's what's normal. And I go through the what age do people have sex for the first time? Uh, how often are people having sex? And really, just take people through like. What is the variation that we're talking about here? Because everybody's like, am I normal? Am I not normal? And these were big questions coming up. I didn't want to talk about it because I'm like, however much sex you're having is normal if you're happy. However much, you know, um, how many, many partners you've had, if you're happy and it's consensual, that's great. Like that's your number. Like that's what it is. But 
there's even um, in the research, it's been found time and again that like when you ask people like how many partners have you had, women round down and men round up. So we don't even have accurate data on this. Like people will say like, oh yeah, well statistically speaking, this is how many partners women have and how many partners men have. And so women are supposed to have less partners. And I'm like, based on surveys where it relies on people to be honest and we know people lie because they feel shame and they're like, I'm not supposed to have that many partners. Yeah, it's like they're like food frequency questionnaires. Oh my God, yeah. Is like one of the foundational tools used in nutrition science and it's like the most uh unreliable way to, to oh, source information absolutely so i like so i have a degree in nutrition science <laughs> so i'm like i love that i'm right there with you where it's like oh yeah or could you do a recall diary and people are like i ate I ate granola. Wait, no, you're looking at me. I ate eggs. Wait, no, it's supposed to be. Um, I had egg whites. And like you're hmm. like, oh my goodness, this does not work. Does the um I mean this is this is uh something I'd love for you to speak on. Some of my my male friends and, and probably men around the world have this like, you know, maybe there's this misconception that the more partners a woman has, the more the vagina stretches, mm, for yeah. lack of a better term. Yeah. You know, we just birth entire humans out of there and it comes back. But yeah, tell me how your penis is so great that you could wreck a vagina. Like, come on. Like, you're so full of yourself. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, men will think that. And, you know, the thing I have to phrase is that, like, people are like, oh, a tight vagina is where it's at. A tight vagina is the equivalent of a flaccid penis. It is not ready to go. It is not aroused. It does not like you, sir. Like, it is mm. not. It's not the thing that you want to find. Because what did you call it? When a woman is aroused, it, like, opens up. Ten Tenting, yes. Tenting. Yeah. So no, um, having as many partners as you had, that's not going to ruin your vagina. Um, having babies, I actually was just um, talking with someone. They were like, oh, my doctor recommended C-sections over vaginal delivery um, because she's like, you don't want to ruin your vagina for sex. And I'm like, do you know any of my patients say that sex got better after they had a baby, like had a vaginal delivery because things changed in a way to where like the clitoris is more exposed. Um, I think there is like, we need research on this. I think there is something to all of the perfusion we have. So the blood flow down there, how much is going on that we actually start to change the nerves in the area to become more sensitive. Mm. And so there's definitely cases where you can have, you know, significant tears and other things, stupid doctors doing husband stitches that pisses me all kinds of off. Um, but with that, and I have a lot of patients who are like, sex is even better. And I think also part of that is because like when you've been naked and um, almost everybody poops when they have a baby, it's just what prostaglandins do, um, which are helping the uterus contract. It's contracting your bowels as well. But you're also like pushing like crazy. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, your, your uterus is also like doing a lot of the work um, as well with that. But yeah, like there's a lot of downward pressure, right? So you get comfortable with your body. And like I said, body image issues can be a major reason why you're not in the mood, why you can't stay present. If you can't be present in sex, you can't have an orgasm. Hmm. Like you have to be mindful. You have to be present with that. Um, and so I think there's that piece as well of like you just get a lot more comfortable with your body. Um, but I was like, man, to be like have this major surgery to possibly save your vagina when we know that there are women who experience prolapse, they still have issues with their vagina after having a baby via C-section and they need pelvic floor physical therapy too. Like, I don't know. To me, I'm like, that just seems very extreme. Like, and a very, I don't know, biased. I'm like, okay, well, what about like the baby? Like, what about what she wants? Like, what about, you know, there's a lot of what abouts. Yeah. What about, because you have a, there are a lot of what abouts. What about, because you mentioned, which I think is so cool that you have a degree in nutrition science. Are there any foods that can facilitate better sex? Oh, so you know what's interesting is saffron is one that can. I'm like, this is why this, this like costs so much. Like this is the <laughs> real reason. Um, and it can actually help people who are on SSRIs. So when you're on SSRIs, it, sexual desire, arousal, orgasms, like that can definitely drop. Saffron's been something that's shown to be helpful. I'm like, who mm. knew? So many women are on SSRIs. Mm, so many people so are many on people. SSRIs. Yeah. And so saffron is something that can be helpful. Um, watermelon rind? Like if you're throwing out your watermelon rind. It's rich in uh, citrulline. Citrulline. Yes. Yeah, so that can be helpful as well. Um, Anti-inflammatory foods. So like turmeric, ginger, those kinds of things. Um, those, sorry, there's a funny story. I'm going to tell you in a minute. <laughs> but those can be really helpful. I don't know if you know why Kelly cereal was invented uh something with libido right <laughs> no, because, sorry as a latina i cannot help but laugh because <laughs> uh yeah kellogg he's just like if we make food bland 
bland AF, okay? If we make it that bland, then people will not have stirrings of sexual desire. Like they will masturbate less. And I'm just like, I travel with hot sauce. <laughs> I put spicy food on everything. Is it any wonder I'm talking about sex? I guess not, Dr. Kellogg, like, you know? <laughs> but Damn. yeah, so um, yeah. And like, think about how that's totally like, destroyed like nutrition and like people's health and all of that so mm. um something people don't often realize or talk about so i talk a lot about hormones and how the adrenal glands and insulin are really the foundation so talking about adrenal glands and metabolic health so everybody wants to chase like testosterone is estrogen progesterone but really we have to have that solid foundation if you have blood sugar dysregulation like this is no joke when it comes to your sexual health so we can see issues with um clitoral sensitivity so decreased clitoral sensitivity not you have diabetes yes definitely in diabetes that can happen but that can happen just by having insulin dysregulation. So decreased clitoral sensitivity. Yes. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Who knew? First Glu time hearing about that. Glucose and insulin are like, they need to be regulated for you to have good sex. How do you measure for that? So with insulin, um, so there's continuous glucose monitors. So for people who don't know, insulin is the hormone that basically knocks on the cell's door and says, hey, I have glucose here. I'm vouching for glucose. Please let glu glucose <laughs> in. Um, so continuous glucose monitor is like a great way. I think it can make some people neurotic uh, in terms of like their food. Like we have seen that. The food pyramid actually, when I was getting my degree, I was like, I had issues. I definitely had issues because I was like, I have to get six servings of grains a day, but okay. I feel I feel awful. I feel so awful getting six. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm having this like existential crisis about like, and then I like learned that it wasn't based on science. And I was like, oh, well, forget that. Okay, we're done with that. Um, so continuous glucose monitors, those can track your glucose. You can see how you respond for, to food. I think that's really brilliant for knowing what's true for you. We can measure your insulin, your fasting insulin, and see where that's at. A hemoglobin A1C, um, that's a marker of your blood sugar over the last three months. That can also be helpful. I think that that should be at least part of your yearly screening. Um, even in your 20s, I'm like, if... If we could prevent like all of the diseases of our 60 plus, like, I mean, that would be amazing. And how do we do that? We actually start with 20. Teenagers would be great, but like, let's let's not kid ourselves. Uh, start with the 20 somethings. Make sure we're monitoring them, we're screening them, we're educating them. Because just like we don't get good sex ed in school, we don't get any nutrition education. That's really, it's not real. Like it's, I mean, it's the same as like, when I tell people only 18 states require medically accurate sex education, if it's not medically accurate, it's not accurate. The same is true for food science. And the food pyramid has never been based on science. And everybody knew it. Everybody knows it. We knew that the American diet, I mean, I was getting a nutrition science degree and concurrently doing the didactic um, program. And I was like, maybe I'll be a registered dietitian. Hmm. Then I was like, doctors don't listen to RDs. That's problematic. And secondly, Coca-Cola is sponsoring us like mm. McDonald's like what how could this not be biased how can we not have like issues in the profession when there's like you don't see like the vegetable farmers like lobbying or like you know sponsoring yeah absolutely I mean nutri nutrition science is sometimes it could feel like reading like tea leaves like because you can find nutrition studies to validate whatever it is that you want to be true so true you know, so I think it's like, it's, it's very hard. I mean, I remember when I was growing up, I got zero nutrition mm -hmm. schooling. Like it just wasn't part of the curriculum. I had phys ed, which barely had any ed, you know, it was yeah, all yeah. phys. But, um, but, which is also who taught your sex ed, right? Yeah. Same teacher. <laughs> I know. What is so weird? <laughs> yeah. Like dodgeball and then sex. i like, what is this? I remember who it was. Yeah. It was Dr. Klein. I remember the exact, I remember the day that we had sex because I was so excited. Yeah. I was so excited to start learning about vulvas. Yeah. And, uh, and we just, we, the whole class, you know, we were in a room and it lasted, it lasted about 50 minutes and it was just like completely unremarkable. Yeah. But, um, with nutrition training, there was nothing. Everything I've ever, I knew about nutrition growing up, I learned from like what my mom would tell me about mm -hmm. how to eat. And my mom was influenced by the dietary guidelines. You know, it was all like low fat, low, you know, yeah. low cholesterol. Well, did any of us not have moms back then that were low fat? Like I was <laughs> see, like I was at home making five eggs in butter. And I was like, man, I feel so bad for <laughs> my mom and that generation that was fat free because man, fat is so good. Like it mm. makes everything. But I mean, there was a period of time I convinced myself that like I didn't like fat because I was like, no, it's not good for you. Like what I did to my 20s, I'm like, what? Yeah. Please don't judge me. Don't the, judge me for the that. The low fat, fat free was such a disaster. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. think like I kind of am at odds with the trend now where the pendulum is swinging the other direction. Everybody's yeah. like high, super high fat, yeah, oil yeah. and butter on everything. I think there's like a happy medium, you know. So, mm -hmm. so, so to some degree, I'm like, you know, 
I are you saying are you just saying middle ground, sir? <laughs> like <laughs> that's not sensational. Like that doesn't get people to click. Oh my god. Well, it does get people to hate because yeah. when you're taking the middle of the, it's like everybody hates you. Oh, that's so. I my last book was on birth control, and it's middle of the road. I'm not anti birth control. I'm not like you know trying to tell anybody what to do. I just want to give you information, help you support your body. Literally, everybody's like, we all hate you, and I'm like, so be it. Like this is just like this is the way it's gonna be. But it's when it comes to food. So when I was getting my degree, they were like, listen. It's going to be politics, religion, and food. These are the three things that piss people off the most. Like, mm. welcome to this profession. Wow. Yeah, I was just on a podcast, um, like at a, a UK show, and I was talking about like the value of red meat mm -hmm. and why omnivory is the way. Like, yeah, you yeah. don't get more balanced than a diet that's inclusive of, of both animal yeah. and plant products, especially today. Mm -hmm. And the amount of because this podcast went out to a very general audience. It wasn't like when I was on Rogan, where I was mm -hmm. kind of like talking to people who are more or less on the same page because yeah, Rogan yeah. is on the same page. Yeah. It was like a completely different audience and the amount of like hate mm -hmm. that I got from it. I mean, overall it was a great experience. I got a lot of positive feedback as yeah. well, but the middle of the road, it's the hardest. Well, and if you talk about eating meat, okay, so there's the vegans and there there can be like the extreme vegans. I feel like in some sense it's kind of religious in like the way that they come about things. And I'm like, if you choose that, that's totally fine. Um, I actually just made an Instagram story about the hardest part about being in LA is finding non-vegan and vegetarian restaurants. I'm mm. like, I just, I need protein. Like you, <laughs> I studied sarcopenic obesity. You don't understand. Like I take this protein thing very seriously, but I think you're absolutely right. Um, so, you know, sustainable agriculture, you can't even have that conversation and just how important like cows are to the microbiome of the earth. Like mm. that blows my mind. People are like, save well, the planet. Well said, by the way. <laughs> that was just very well said. Yeah, well, it's absolutely true. Um, there's, you know, we see all these people saying like, oh, go plant-based, go plant-based. That's what's best for the planet. And if you actually look at it, which we've known for decades now, that's not what's good for the planet. And the problem with the way we do agriculture, the poor husbandry practices is actually what would need to be addressed. Not stop eating meat, like, you know, stop eating Hearst Farm meat. Don't get it from a big feedlot kind of situation. Like, follow Foster Farms chicken? No. Pass. Like, no. Like, can you find a local farmer? And that is also the issue I take with um, the whole nutrition conversation is people get really myopic about what's best for them and they exclude the farmer and the field workers. And you'll hear this a lot with the organic conversations where people are like, organic's not better for you. There's no science that has more nutritional value. I'm like, no one's ever said that it had more nutritional value. <laughs> they said it had less pesticides, less carcinogens, less crap that we know is bad for us and also bad for the earth. And they're like, well, who cares? That's just like, you know, the, you know, whatever excuse they want to have. And I'm like, how do you care so little for the farm workers? Like we see the outcomes with them. Like, the high rates of cancer they have. And you're telling me just to shut up because you don't want, like, you just think that's some kind of trend when in reality, like, there is not only the whole ecosystem, there are other humans being negatively impacted by this. Oof, amen. And yeah, I mean, it's not just the cancer. It's like there are certain um, herbicides. Reproductive that, harm? <laughs> reproductive harm yeah. that when exposed to at occupational levels is mm -hmm. associated with dramatically increased risk for Parkinson's disease. Yep. All kinds of nasty stuff. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at like the Central Coast or not the Central Coast, Central California, like, and you'll see like thyroid cancers on the rise and people are like, I don't understand what's happening there. I'm like, I do. Wow. Like this is where all the fields are. And so why aren't we having those conversations? Uh, it's like the same thing that you'll see like anyone who works with women and fertility, like women in the sense of their hormones. So reproductive endocrinologists, especially like, and they're doing infertility treatments. They're like no parabens, like no BPA, no bisphenols of any kind, like get all of this out. And then you'll see like a dermatologist being like, these are fine to have in your skincare. They're just fear mongering. And it's like, what are we waiting for? Like, we know that sperm count is drastically declining. Like men have like 50% of the sperm that their grandfathers had. And like, what are we waiting for? And in the United States, we're like, until like enough people die and it's very proven to be problematic, like very proven, not just shown at some point, then we'll remove it. But like the, the burden lies on the consumer to do that. Wow. Use less plastic and also avoid store register receipts. Oh my gosh, the, yes. The exposure is massive with those, mm -hmm. as far as I know, with, with uh, yeah. bisphenol A. Yeah. No. So I actually just had testing done. Um, so I wanted to test like my environmental toxin exposure. And I don't have plastic in my house. I don't drink out of plastic water bottles. I, but I had BPA exposure. And I'm like, man, I like avoid receipts. And I'm like, except the Costco receipt. The Costco receipt that you have to show at the door, like I usually throw it in the thing, um, in the cart, but 
I live in the tropics and I'm sweaty and like, I'm like, man, just touching that. Like, and I won't let my kids touch it, but I'm like, I have to ask, like, is that the place that like I'm getting BPA exposure? Because like when I took this test, I'm like, I had been to Costco that week. Is that where it was coming in? Wow. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. It's not just bringing our C game to the person that we live with or who we love or we're in a relationship with. It, it's how much are we just dropping into our C game in general? Whereas when we first met, we were just in a really good state. We were looking at the glass and seeing it half full instead of half empty. 